All right, I think we are good to get started. So good evening, everyone. My name is Albany. I work with the city of Sunnyvale, and I am going to be helping moderate tonight's event on edible gardening for beginners. So I'm just going to go over a couple quick housekeeping things. Um, all attendees are muted by default, um, but we want to hear your questions. And so please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen to submit questions throughout Suzanne's presentation. And then we'll ask them to her live at the end. Um, at the end, you can also raise your hand if you'd like to ask a brief question to Suzanne directly. Um, so keep those questions in mind throughout our presentation. We'll have about half an hour at the end for those. And then in case you miss anything or you want to revisit anything in this presentation, the webinar will be recorded and it will be made available on the Bosco website in a couple weeks. Next. So a little bit about Bosca. Bosca represents 26 agencies that include cities, water districts, a water company, and a university that purchase water wholesale from the San Francisco Regional Water System. The Bosca member agencies provide water to 1.8 million people, over 40,000 businesses and community organizations in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo counties. And Bosca's goal is to provide high quality water at a fair price. So the objectives of the Bosca program, first off, outdoor water use represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bosca service area. And second, outdoor water use reduction through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques, such as those we'll be going over tonight, can help conserve water and ensure that future water supply needs of our communities are met. So I'm going to go over a couple ways that um, a lot of you can save money in our communities through some Bosca programs. And I will drop the links for these programs in just a minute. So we have the Lawn Be Gone program, um, which is through Bosca. You can get up to $4 per square foot of lawn replaced with water efficient alternatives. And then there's also rain barrel rebates. So Bosca, some of you might have been to some rainwater harvesting workshops in the past. If you have, or maybe if you haven't, then you know that rain barrels are a great way to harvest rainwater in our communities, especially since rain can be a little sparse. Um, and you could use that water to water your garden throughout the year. And Bosca also has uh, rebates for rain barrels. So you can save up to $200 on those. And then a couple new programs. Um, there's a smart controller rebate and installation program. That's a sprinkler program. And then there's an optional rain garden rebate program. Um, and then rain gardens that meet the minimum requirements will be rate rebated $300. Um, so there's more um, information on these on the Bosco website and I'll drop the link to that in just a minute as well. And then these are some of our upcoming workshops. Um, we just started the Bosco workshop spring season last month. So we have a bunch coming up um, and you can learn more about these and register for these on the Bosco website. So even if you don't take it all down now, no problem, just search on the website. And then um, if you go to bayareagardening.org, there's a database of a bunch of plants, um, gardens and re resources for water efficient gardening. All right. Well, thank you so much, Albany. Um, I'm very excited for all of us that are joining tonight. I am Suzanne Bontempo, and I am going to be talking to you all about edible water-wise gardening for beginners. So welcome. It is Earth Day tomorrow. This is Earth Week. This is Earth Year. And I'm so excited to share growing food in our gardens with a waterwise approach with you in honor of Earth Day. So the agenda that I have for us this evening is that I'm going to go through slides for about 45 minutes, then I'm going to leave time for your questions afterwards. And what we're going to learn is how to increase the health of our soil, how to water efficiently and effectively, how to plant a water-wise veggie garden, why uh, working with cover, cover crops helps us when we want to save water and which food crops are most water wise. And then I have a few additional resources that I'd like to share. So as an IPM educator, 
which is what I do uh, pretty much on a daily basis. I'm also the program manager for Our Water, Our World and teach people how to solve pest problems with a less toxic approach and grow beautiful gardens with less pests, both ornamental and edible gardens. Um, I always just like to start by just uh, talking a little bit about integrated pest management or IPM for short. So IPM, is a decision-making process that uses science-based strategies. It allows us to look at the system as a whole. In this case, it's gonna be our garden. And it helps us to identify when there is a problem that comes up. And when a problem comes up, we ask ourselves, is it a problem that we can live with? And if it's a problem that we actually need to take some action, we use a combination of actions which is going to be cultural controls, bolstering the health of the garden, uh, the mechanical controls or the tools we use to prevent and solve pest problems. Biological controls are going to be using li living organisms to manage the pests. And then chemical controls are the pesticides. And we always wanna use these as a last resort and we always wanna use the least toxic possible. If there is a situation where you have a plant that just has always struggled, um, just never really performed the way that you'd like, give yourself permission just to get rid of it. And then you get to replace it with something that's going to be better suited for your garden that isn't going to be so problemsome and that will just thrive with a little bit more ease. Now, the reason why I mention all of this is that we wanna set our water-wise gardens up for success. And it really does, um, we really want to understand the foundation of integrated pest management to do that. So we apply IPM methods to growing food with a water wise approach. And it all starts with the soil. So just to back up a little bit, I just want to briefly touch on soil and what soil is. So soil is, um, is a combination uh, or the components of soil are going to be mineral particles, water, air, and then organic matter. And you see here, we just have about 5% organic matter listed. This is kind of the ideal goal that we're trying to achieve. This is just your average, really, really good, healthy soil. It's going to have about 5% organic matter. Now, soil texture. Now that's going to refer to, if anyone has ever asked you that question, what kind of soil do you have? This is what they're asking. They're asking what's the soil texture. So it would be sand, which has very, very large particles, particles that you could see with your eye. And then it also, with that, those particles you'll have, will have large uh, pore spaces uh, or air spaces between those particles. And then silt, it's going to have medium particles and pore sizes that are also going to be medium sized. And then clay is going to have very, very tiny microscopic uh, particle sizes that are tightly packed, almost stacked on top of each other with very, very, very little air spaces between. So then we have soil structure and soil structure is how the soil components relate to each other, how they hold together and what we want to strive for. Um, and I'll share the soil structure can be a combination of soil textures, anything between sand, silt and clay. But when we're looking talking about soil structure, we want to strive for a soil that's actually going to hold together well, but allow root systems to grow, to allow nutrients and water and air to move through that soil, as well as earthworms and other microorganisms. And how we achieve this is by adding compost to the soil. So regardless if we've got sand or clay or anything in between, when we add compost to the soil, we're actually increasing the health of the soil, which means we are um, increasing the health of the plants. We're also increasing the water holding capacity, which is very important. We also, when we're adding compost to the soil, we're adding microbiology to that soil, which in turn is only going to uh, benefit our plants and the root systems of those plants. And the way we get compost into the soil, if this is just a raised bed, uh, that needs refreshing and we haven't planted yet or a section of the garden that is bare and we're about to plant, then we can just lay out about two inches of compost on that soil and then with our fork or our shovel, we are going to turn that compost into the top like 
uh, four to six inches of soil. That means we just turned in and, and amended about six to eight inches of soil, which means we've added about 25% compost to it, which is a really nice way to incorporate the compost. If we have, uh, if we have other plants in the area and we're just planting individually, then we're going to spot amend. That's what I call it, where we will just take, dig the hole, add some compost, uh, add our dry fertilizer, and then we'll plant the plant. Another way to get compost out into the garden, if the garden's already established with plants, is to lay a couple inches of compost on top of the soil underneath the mulch layer. What compost might look like, we, we could certainly buy it in bulk at the local landscape supply store. However, we can also buy it by the bag. So it comes in a lot of different, um, under a lot of different names. It can be called soil conditioner or soil amend or planting compost or planting mix, raised bed mix, soil builder, loam builder. These are all kind of the same thing or very similar. We're going to amend the soil with these nice rich organic matters which are compost. And I'd encourage you to, um, you know, if you're curious, just read the back of the bag. It'll have a list of all the ingredients that that compost or that planting mix is made of. And the reason why we add um, compost to our soil is to inoculate that soil and increase the microbiology, which is going to be the beneficial fun fungi and the beneficial bacteria. And when we do this, we're actually, um, adding this beneficial microbiology, which helps break down organic material. It helps to store nutrients in the soil. It also helps to break down toxins and pollutants, but more importantly, it helps to hold the soil together and it increases the water holding capacity. So, uh, um, we have, you know, the bacteria, which a lot of times we'll see those little, um, nodulars on like uh, like fava bean roots or other leg uh, legumes. Uh, this is going to be uh, free nitrogen for our plants or mycorrhizal fungi, which is this uh, uh, beautiful um, webbing of uh, a fungal network that will help increase the um, nutrient and water uptake for the root systems. It enhances that and makes it a lot easier for those plants to thrive which then makes a healthier, happier plant. We also want to feed our plants with organic fertilizers. And when we work with organic fertilizers, we're actually uh, feeding the microbiology in the soil, which in turn is um, feeding the plants. It's making the nutrients uh, available to the plant when the plants need it. It also increases the health of the microbiology, really supporting the health of that soil. And what organic fertilizer does, because it's feeding at a more natural rate, it's preventing um, a lot of excessive growth to be stimulated. And why, what this means is that when we work with synthetic fertilizers, those chemical synthetic fertilizers act like steroids for plants, which is um, really stimulating a lot of new growth. And when we have a lot of new growth being stimulated, what we found is that the pest insects like aphids uh, really love that tender, juicy new growth. And it makes those plants more prone and susceptible to getting pest problems. It also over time is going to stress the plant out. It's kind of like us taking steroids all the time. At some point, our bodies just start to break down. So it's going to be more sustainable and more healthy for the garden as a whole when we can work with organic fertilizers and feed our plants accordingly. So here is an illustration that kind of speaks to that. So the organic fertilizers are feeding the organic matter, uh, and the soil nutrients and the microorganisms in the soil, which then in turn have the symbiotic relationship with the root systems. Whereas the chemical fertilizers are strictly only feeding the plant. So if we're using synthetic fertilizers, then that plant kind of becomes dependent on that fertilizer for food. Um, because it doesn't have that network of microbiology in the soil around the root zone to support it. Something else to keep in mind is that most of the synthetic fertilizers, these chemical fertilizers are very, very high in salts. And if we are not, um, you know, if we're applying them 
often, you know, as it's required, as it says on the back of the bag or the box, how often, how frequent to apply these fertilizers. Um, and we are watering, um, if we're not watering really well, uh, there, ha there can be a tendency for salt to build up in the top couple inches of the soil, which is really detrimental to our plants, especially as we're moving towards water conservation. When we're look, trying to increase the health of the garden with the water wise approach, synthetic fertilizers have a tendency to, um, those salts have a tendency to be a little bit detrimental to the soils as well as the plants. So something I can share is that uh, um, food crops, our food crops really love alfalfa. Uh, uh, they love alfalfa meal. It is like, it, it supercharges our plants. Uh, it adds nitrogen and trace minerals to the soil. It improves the tilth of the soil and contains a natural fatty acid growth stimulant. I cannot pronounce that word, so I'm not gonna try. However, what I can share is that when I am planting my uh, food crops, I am doing equal parts of a really good organic uh, food, uh, like fruit and vegetable or all purpose fertilizer, equal parts of that with alfalfa meal. I'm gonna uh, put uh, that into the planting hole at the same time, which is really going to give my plants a little bit more vigor. And then earthworm castings. Earthworm castings are uh, maybe the most amazing thing you can uh, feed your plants. It is super food for our food crops. Um, you don't need a lot. You really only need like a tablespoon or two per plant. And again, at time of planting, I'll just, you know, work that into the soil around the root zone. It contains an abundance of nutrients and uh, minerals essential for plants to thrive. It contains important enzymes and beneficial bacteria and humus that is only going to support the health of our plant. It provides dynamic root growth, growth and plant structure. And it also has a very um, highly effective, there's um, chitins inside the uh, earthworm castings that work through the cell structure of the plant that are highly effective for preventing insect pests and inhibits diseases. So it almost acts like as this repellent or almost makes the plant so resilient that it's not going to get pests or diseases. This is key, especially as we move into stressful drought times, or you know, if we're faced with some water stress times, the plants are going to be able to move through those times with ease. And then throughout the growing season, I like to uh, feed my plants, especially my annual vegetable crops, which I'll share in a minute, the annual food crops, which are just for a season, you know, like for instance, right now we might just put in our zucchini and our tomatoes and maybe string beans. They're just going to get us through to about September, October, and that's the season. Whereas we might have perennial crops like artichokes that I... We don't need to uh, fertilize as often, but through the growing season for our annual crops, I like to feed with a liquid fertilizer. I mix it up in the watering can and I can just water it in about once a month or you know, twice a month according to the labels uh, instructions. And this is a really easy way to uh, get that fertilizer and feed that microbiology throughout the growing season without having to scratch in um, more fertilizer into the soil because that could disrupt the root systems. And certain plants, specifically tomatoes, really like to have a little bit of extra calcium. So if you're looking to add a little calcium to the soil, that's going to be natural and organic. This is an awesome fertilizer to check out. This is by, um, the Pacific Northwest Organics, it's called Ocean's Gold, sorry. Um, and you can get it at a, local, a lot of the local garden centers and hardware stores. Ooh, pardon me. All right, and then we're gonna to top that soil off with mulch. We're gonna protect that soil. Uh, and the mulch that I'm talking to is something that's going to be like organic, uh, some type of organic material. You know, it could absolutely be compost, but in this case, I'm talking about wood chips or wood bark chips, or even like rice straw that you can get at the feed store. If you happen to live near a feed store, rice straw is great, but uh, wood chips or any type of like uh, cedar bark or um, arbor mulch, things like that. We want to uh, put a nice layer on top of the soil, even around our vegetables and fruit trees 
to help reduce water evaporation rate, which when we put a nice layer of mulch on top of the soil, it is going to reduce that water evaporation significantly. We're also going to see that uh, there's going to be less weeds because weed seeds are less likely to germinate. And if they do, they're a heck of a lot easier to pull. Um, as the mulch breaks down, it uh, feeds the soil and supports that microbiology in the soil. It also reduces soil compaction and erosion. And more importantly, uh, I'd say second to uh, the, you know, reducing water evaporation is that it keeps the soil cool in the summer and warm in the winter. However, one thing I wanted to share is if we, uh, something I've just recently learned is that when we go to the store, some businesses, some of our retailers sell dyed mulch. Now the dyes are fine. They're just vegetable based, they're not toxic. But something to keep in mind is those dyes can leach if you've got like a porous like flagstone patio or walkway or a concrete that's porous, it can leach and stain. But also if it's a dyed mulch, like dyed black mulch, it can uh, hold a lot of heat. So this is either a good thing or a bad thing. It's either, you know, if we live in a hot part of the county, then we probably, that might, it might be holding too much heat. But if we live in a cooler part of the county, maybe we want to use that darker mulch to retain the heat. So just something to keep in mind. And then we always want to make sure the mulch is away from the crown of the plant, from the stems of the plant. So where the top part of the plant meets the root system, we always want to make sure that's clear so that nice air circulation can flow. So now let's talk about the planning. So this is a question that's already come up. I received an email about this. It's, um, we really want to be honest about how much sunshine we have. And um, I'm not talking about areas where we might have fog because the UV still comes through. I'm talking about shade from like a building or a fence or a tree. So uh, we want to be really uh, honest. And if we and we can only plant plants that are going to thrive with this sun exposure. So understand that full sun is going to be six or more hours. And how we find out is we can, uh, when we're at the store, we're going to look at these little tags and we're going to get some good information on the tags, or we're going to reference our Sunset Western Garden Book or any of our other garden books that we have. Part sun, part shade is going to be three to six hours of direct sun. And this is really speaking to the first half of the day, the morning sun, because the morning sun is cooler than the afternoon sun. If we have a uh, part sun, part shade in the afternoon, like from one o'clock on, that's a little hotter. So we want to maybe uh, talk to uh, the professionals at the garden center or talk, reach out to your master gardeners just to check in to see what would really thrive. We, if we do um, have uh, sun in the um, second half of the day that's hot, we might also have to employ some shade cloth just to help prevent that uh, direct sun being so strong. And then of course, dappled sun is filtered sun all day and then shade is no direct sunlight. And then I just wanted to share that growing uh, in raised bed saves water. It provides better drainage because we're able to put in really nice yummy, perfect soil. We're able to line the bottom with gopher wire or half inch hardware cloth to prevent any gophers from coming up and eating the root systems. We're able to uh, control the soil. We can then go to the garden center and like really like select the type of soil we want to put in there. Uh, we are able now to water very localized. We're only watering and feeding the certain area. So it really is able to control how much water we put out. It's going to um, you know, reduce soil compaction because we're not walking around the plants. They're actually up in this raised bed. We're not walking in that area so that water, that soil stays light and fluffy the whole time. And then when we plant, we want to plant close together. Now, I'm not talking super, super close, but a little closer than normal. So planting close is actually smart and very uh, strategic. So we're gonna plant together like on a, um, in clusters on a diamond grid or a hex pattern, okay? And the reason why is because as those plants grow, they start to shade the soil, which is going to, continue to reduce water evaporation. It's going to keep the, uh, it's going to create its own little microclimate, which kind of keeps nice, uh, it kind of keeps it cool in there. And it also prevents weeds from um, 
germinating and growing. But as we harvest this, we're going to be harvesting every other plant. So we're almost thinning the plants so that then we can uh, eat those food crops and then what's remaining will continue to grow and fill in. And of course, this is going to primarily be for leafy greens and stuff. This won't really apply to like tomatoes or zucchinis, things like that. And then from here, we let's talk about which plants are best. So one of my favorite things to talk about is growing heirloom food crops. So heirloom veggies, because heirloom varieties are from Mediterranean regions, which are ideal for our climate. And they are typically more drought tolerant and they're water savers. So the cool thing now is heirlooms are all the rage. We can go to just about any garden center and we can get seeds that are heirloom crops or we can buy little starts that are heirlooms. And it's really, really fun. It's new, different varieties. And uh, yeah, it's um, kind of neat to learn that they're actually going to adapt better to our climate. And if um, any of you are not familiar with the National Heirloom Expo, I encourage you to check it out. Of course, it didn't happen this past year because of COVID. Hopefully it'll happen this next year, but it's always um, after Labor Day in September up at the fairgrounds in um, Santa Rosa. It's the coolest thing. You can at least check it out online. So I'm a huge fan of growing perennial food crops. They are going to be extremely water wise because we are just going to plant them. And once established, we are not going to have to water them as frequently as we would with annual food crops. And some perennial food crops you might already be familiar with and you might already be eating like artichokes and asparagus, chives, um, sorrel, uh, scarlet runner beans, tree collards. There's also Jerusalem artichokes and walking onions, which that's kind of a newer one for me. I've never grown those yet, but I uh, hear they're really cool and I've seen them at other gardens. But one of my most favorites is the scarlet runner bean. And the reason why is because it's a perennial, but it's also a three season food crop. So we plant it now, um, these gorgeous, uh, fuchsia and black colored beans. We plant them now and as they grow, they're going to grow just like a string bean, you know, a pole bean would. And when they're young, we harvest them and we eat them just like we would any type of string bean. But then if we keep them on the vine a little longer, they get a little bigger, they get slightly tougher. Uh, and this would be more, you know, like summer to mid to late summer, we would actually uh, harvest them and uh, work them into stews and soups and really kind of saute and braise them. Or we can leave them on the vine and harvest them in the fall, late fall, and just before winter uh, as a dry bean. And then we can store it over the winter into early spring. And we'll have these dry beans that then we can work into soups and stews or make refried scarlet runner beans, anything like that. It's a lot of fun. And it's especially fun if we've got kids in the family because to go out and to pick this, uh, these beans and open up and see this fuchsia and black bean inside is, it's magic, it's crazy, it's a lot of fun. But then our annual food crops, I have to say, there's a, there's a lot of our annual food crops like chard, kale, mustard greens, radishes and potatoes that do not need as much water as we might think. And this is one of my most favorites. I've been growing this for years now. This is a, another, two season uh, squash. So the tatuma is a uh, heirloom from Mexico and it grows like a zucchini or you know any summer squash. It does need a little bit of room. The vines can go out about 20 feet but it produces a lot of food. So we harvest them young, these little green like summer squashes or we can leave them on the vine and then harvest as a fall uh, winter squash. So um, this is really cool that again, we would bake them or put them in soups and stews. This is a really cool veggie. And let me tell you it, once it starts to take off, we really can reduce the water on it. And then other crops that are going to, you know, do well, arugula is very water wise. It can handle, you know, having a few days of drying out. Uh, our beets, our carrots, our cucumbers, lettuces, and uh, we, we want to water, once they're established, 
we're able to really reduce the water. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And I'm just gonna mention something about tomatoes because I have heard from a couple people lately that their tomatoes have a tendency to get white flies uh, in the summer, around July or August. And what I know, as a pest educator is that, uh, now this isn't always the case, but a lot of times white flies are an um, indicator of overwatering. So when we start to talk about how to water our crops, I just wanna share that if you've had this experience, when we water, we really, once these plants are established, once our cucumbers and our zucchini and other summer squash and our tomatoes are really established, those root systems have really reached deeply so we're not gonna to have to water as frequently. We still wanna water deeply, but we don't have to water as frequently so we can really reduce the days that we're watering. Another fun crop to grow that is extremely water wise is garlic. We plant this in uh, October, November, you know, usually around Halloween or just that week, a uh, first week in November is what I shoot for. And then it stays in a bed for quite a while, a good solid eight to nine months, and then we're not harvesting to June. But this plant, we it does not require regular watering. We really are going to get through that rainy season, and if it haven't had any rain or water for about a week, then we can water it. But it really likes to be dried out, and it likes good draining soil. And then we don't consider a lot of our herbs. There are so many herbs that are also going to be, uh, well, they're going to thrive in a Mediterranean climate or our summer dry climate. And uh, we can um, harvest these herbs. They can grow with ease outside, either in the ground or containers, but they're all going to do a little better with a little bit less water once established. So what I've found is that we have a tendency all to be a little heavy handed with the water. So I think it's just kind of fun. We wanna always like fuss a little bit. Another thing to consider for food crops beyond vegetables is fruit trees and fruiting vines. These are going to give us a lot of food without a lot of effort or resources. So here, I just like to picture uh, kiwis. They grow so well in this area. And the flower on the left is the flower of the kiwi fruit. And the first time I saw that, it blew my mind because I feel like that flower looks exactly like a kiwi when you cut it in half, the cross section. I don't know, it's just wild. It's a lot of fun. And then for those of us that have small spaces, uh, growing miniature fruit trees is a really great way to get fruits into our gardens without a lot of space. And when we can plant them in larger containers like this half barrel, we are able actually to water very thoroughly and we're not gonna water again until the good few inches is dry. So this could be a couple of days. And then espalier fruit trees is another way to get uh, fruit trees along a fence or along the side of a house. And uh, once established, they're going to require less water. Another thing that's really helpful for our gardens is working with cover crops. So fava beans are my favorite. They're very, very easy to work with. They grow with a lot of ease in our climate uh, and they also give me food. So it's one of those win-wins. The fava beans are going to be best when we plant them in the fall so that they can have the cool winter season. And then we can uh, remove them uh, before we're ready to put in our late winter, early spring crops. But as those fava beans grow, we have those tips. What I like to do is I'll harvest the top three or four inches of the fava bean tips when they're fresh and young. I chop them up and put it with a little bit of uh, sesame oil and garlic, saute it up, it's delicious. And then, of course, uh, we can let some of the fava beans grow into full bean. We can enjoy those beans, we can eat those beans, and then we can save some of those beans for next year's cover crop growing season. But if we're using it as a cover crop and we're trying to take advantage of those that free nitrogen, then uh, we're going to want to make sure we are very specific and strategic about our, our uh, planting. So there can always be a section of the garden that you're just planting fava beans for food and for the bean to harvest, you know, for it to complete its life cycle. But if I'm planting for a cover crop, after I've cut my tomatoes at the base, I never rip out my plants. I'll just cut them at the base and leave those root systems intact. 
or if it's my um, cucumbers, or if it's the green beans, or the peppers, or whatever the food crop is, then I'm going to uh, plant my fava beans. It's going to work excellent to keep protect that soil through the uh, through the winter season. If I'm not planting any leafy greens or uh, cold season crops, and and then. As the plants grow, the root systems start to develop and then you'll see these little white uh, nodes. I, I don't know how much, do you see them on the screen? It might look like perlite, uh, but are these little tiny white specks, that's actually the nitrogen, these little uh, bacteria that grow and create nitrogen. So if I wanna keep that nitrogen in the soil before the plant really goes into full flower. It's going to start to uh, create these flowers that are beautiful little black and white flowers. But right when those flowers start to open up, we're going to cut this plant at the base. And the reason why is because if we want to use this as a cover crop and to enhance the soil, we plant the pl we cut the plant when it's fairly young, because if the plant were to go all the way to uh, produce beans, it takes so much energy for the that plant to produce those large beans. It's going to take all of that nitrogen in its root system and utilize it. So if we want to uh, capture that nitrogen, we're going to cut the plants at the base and then. We're going to think about that grid pattern again. We're going to plant our tomatoes or our cucumbers or our summer squash just in between where these fava beans were planted. And then as those root systems grow, they're going to become woven in with the fava bean root systems and be able to capture and take advantage of that nitrogen. Isn't that cool? And then we don't want to forget about the flowering plants. And the reason why is because we want to attract beneficial insects. Let me tell you, I have a huge, you know, habitat of ladybugs, ladybug larvae, and um, lacewings out there. It's amazing. So we want to choose plants that attract beneficial insects, which means we want to grow biodiversity. And we do this by adding in plants that are going to be insectary plants. And these are going to be plants that will offer nectar and pollen to our beneficial insects. And most of our beneficial insects are very, very tiny. So we want to plant flowering plants that offer tiny flowers, such as yarrow, the picture on the bottom, or anything, excuse me, that looks like a daisy, or in this case, the aster that's in my screensaver right behind me. And the reason why is because we look at this daisy, we might just see one flower, but those petals are actually rays that attract the insects. And that yellow button in the middle, that's actually hundreds of tiny little flowers. This is the same that you might see with large sunflowers. You'll see all those tiny flowers inside the middle where the bees are buzzing around. So where we can plant flowering plants that um, are tiny, like sweet alyssum or nyaro, and ceanothus, uh, or plants that look like daisies or sunflowers, like cosmos and um, coreopsis and gallardia, then we're able to attract a lot of beneficial insects that will help keep the balance in the garden. Now, I don't know how many of you have had this experience. We are growing summer squash and it just starts to rot and you're panicking because you think that there's a fungus in the soil or a fungus on the plant. I get this every, you know, summer or actually around May, people start asking me about this and they're freaked out and they're like, is there anything I can do? Do I have to pull the plant out? And I have to share that, um, ask them if they have any flowering plants in the area to attract beneficial insects, specifically pollinators, specifically a bee that pollinates the summer squash because this is from lack of pollinators. So if you have this experience, you might need to either uh, beef up the flowers around the area or go on YouTube and read uh, or watch some videos about how you can self-pollinate the male and female flowers so that we can get our uh, crops to grow. Kind of funny. All right, now we're going to talk about how to plant and water. So when we buy these uh, plants from the retailer, they come in little cell packs or four inch or one gallon containers, right? 
And if we're growing from seed in like a little greenhouse, we're going to have them in some type of a container. This is, um, of course, if you're just planting the seed straight in the ground, this is not what you'll be faced with. But we buy these plants and we have these little tags. And these tags are really helpful tools for us because what we want to do is we want to encourage those root systems to grow out. We don't want to bury it or you know plant it in this little contained area where those roots would actually grow together and girdle itself. So what we want to do is we take it out of that little pack and we start to tease those roots to really open those roots up. Don't be afraid that you're ripping them too much. We want to kind of just rip them a little bit. We want to be gentle, but we also want to make sure that they are, we're encouraging those roots, those little fine root hairs to grow outward. And then when we water, we want to remember that the roots are only going to go where the water goes. We want to encourage the root systems to grow out and down, okay? Because we want really nice deep roots. Because when we have deep roots, we don't have to water as often. Something else to consider is what kind of soil we have, because the way, uh, because the type of soil we have is also going to dictate how we water. If we've got sandy soil, that water is going to rush right down. So we want to um, prevent the water from going too far past the root system. So we might have to pulse that water out, giving it a little bit at a time to slowly encourage the root systems to grow down. Okay. Whereas clay soil, it's going to be really hard for that water to even infiltrate. So we might also have to pulse that water out and let that water, uh, you know, absorb into the soil at a rate that it can handle. So this is another way to look at this. We want to understand how water is able to infiltrate through our soil and we want to water accordingly. Now, watering and understanding how to water in and understanding are we giving our plants enough water and how frequently this is one of the hardest things to understand this is one of the hardest things to teach people so just want to share let me actually just back up for a second so when we water we go we're going to water deeply we really want to kind of gauge our watering to get to about five inches down and then we're not watering again until the top few inches is dry now on plants where our root systems let's go back to our root systems are only this big well we want to water very shallowly until we can get the root systems to start to grow a little deeper. So it's always a little bit more water and then less frequent and a little bit more water and less frequent. So hopefully that makes sense. And then we can do this with a lot of ease with drip irrigation systems. So not all of us have the drip irrigation systems. Um, you might be hand watering, so you're gonna have to kind of uh, keep this in mind. But when we work with drip irrigation, we're able to uh, allow for effective and localized deep watering. We're really able to let those emitters release the volume of water at a very slow rate so it can actually move into the soil with a little bit more ease. We're also making direct contact with the soil so there's gonna be less water evaporation. When we use sprinklers overhead water, understand there's a, a percentage of that water that just evaporates into the air or blows away so we're going to lose it. Uh, we also are going to see less weeds when we are working with drip irrigation systems because we're only watering the plants that we want to water. We're not watering areas of the garden that are bare and so thus weeds are going to thrive. We can also set the clocks for early in the morning when the air and the soil are cool. This is the best time to water. So we want to water uh, ideally between like uh, maybe three and four in the morning, all the way up to about 7 a.m. So like that window of like four to 7 a.m. or three to six, that's the best time to water. It is, gives the plants enough time to uh, kind of dry out throughout the day without staying too wet because if plants stay too wet, then uh, fungal problems could occur. And then we're able to also, if we're working with uh, these types of clocks, we can actually set the clocks for multiple uh, start times so that we can water uh, and, uh, you know, according to the sand or, so, uh, or clay like soil conditions, if the texture of the soil isn't really letting us pull, you know, let the water absorb well or infiltrate well, we are able to pulse that water out. So that's the cool thing about working with these clocks. 
And if we don't have one of those clocks that is wired in, uh, you know, to the garage or the shed, we can get these really cool remote clocks that are either battery or solar operated that get connected to a hose bib. They're going to work just as well. And then at the other end of these irrigation clocks, we have the irrigation uh, tubing. So it's going to be the uh, half inch tubing, which is the PE tubing, and then also the little quarter inch tubing, which is spaghetti tubing, and these emitters. So we want to understand what is the flow rate coming up the flow rate of the water that's getting released from the emitters. Is it half gallon per hour? Is it two gallons per hour? Is it one gallon per hour? Because this is really gonna help us understand how much we need to water our plants. Because if we've got a half gallon per hour emitter or a two gallon per hour emitter, that's a big difference. And then from there, especially in the hot areas of the Bay, we want to take advantage of uh, different types of tools such as painting the trunks to protect the trees, especially our young fruit trees, but also our young ornamental trees. And we wanna take advantage of shade cloth. So when we plant new uh, fruit trees or um, ornamental trees, it's really important to paint those trunks all the way up to where the branches start to grow out with either a 50-50 latex paint to water. Any light color will do. It could be a, you know, white or cream or soft pink or um, light green or whatever color. It just has to be very pale. Or you can buy products like the IV Organics, which is a whitewash that also has other things in it that help protect the uh, plants from, um, in some cases, insects and rodents. So you could check that out. But then when we're working with shade cloth, uh, what we want to keep in mind is that our plants are going to start to thrive and they're start, going to start to grow. And then it's going to be around June or July when we're going to start to hit those higher temperatures. And we might very well have a day that's all of a sudden like, oh wow, it got over you know, 90 or 95 degrees. And the plants, though they're well hydrated and the soil's wet, they might look wilted. It does not mean that the plants need more water. What it means is that is too much sun and it's just trying to shut down to protect itself from the heat of the sun. And then by the time the sun passes and goes down and the day cools off, those plants are gonna perk back up. So a way to uh, protect our plants is to work with shade cloth. But we always wanna make sure there's nice airflow. So you see how this shade cloth is set up? It's just providing shade. It's not capturing the heat. And shade cloth is going to come in a number of different percentages. So if we live in a um, hot area, that and we have some um, plants that are just a little bit more tender. So we might have some um, plants that prefer to have a little bit of shade year round. I see this in um, a lot of community gardens. We're looking at like just a 10% uh, shade cloth. But if this is going to be a plant that's more sun sensitive, we're gonna maybe look at a 30% shade cloth. And these are things we can buy at the local hardware store or local garden center. But it's really important to understand the shade percentage. But during the heat of the summer, even for all of our food crops, like our uh, basil or our peppers, even our tomatoes sometimes, when it, we have that week of excessive heat, we're going to have to take advantage of getting some shade on our crops to protect them. And that's going to be, uh, you know, anywhere from a 30 to 50% is going to be ideal. Uh, we're going to prevent, um, I'm sorry, we're going to work with uh, shade cloths that are got, not going to be any more than 40 to 60%. That's really going to be the maximum. And then for plants that are shade lovers, they prefer 75% or higher, depending on the plant's needs. And just to put it in perspective, for us, for our needs, we prefer 80 to 90%. So hopefully that's helpful. And then um, just to, you know, check back in uh, how, you know, tips for maintaining our water-wise garden, we're going to build the healthy soil with compost. We're going to feed our plants with organic fertilizers. We're going to water to encourage really nice deep root systems. 
We're going to grow biodiversity so we can invite the beneficials in so that they could take care of uh, the bad bugs and keep the balance. We're going to monitor for pests and you know take care of problems when they come up. We're going to harvest our food and we're going to enjoy the bounty. Some resources for you I'd like to share is the um, Our Water Our World website has a really cool catalog of fact sheets. These fact sheets address certain pest problems, very common ones that we are faced with, such as ants and aphids, rats and mice, um, yellow jackets, mosquitoes, and so forth. And they're really great, just usually a page or two that you can read that really kind of help address uh, less toxic pest problem solving, specifically with an IPM approach. And then of course, there's the UC IPM program, which is just a wealth of information. I go to UC IPM all the time to get information on plants or if there's a pest problem and I learn about the life cycle of that pest or it helps me with pest identification. Um, that could be an insect or a disease because if we can't identify the pest problem, it's really hard to manage it. And a lot of times what we see are symptoms of a problem. So when I go to the UCIPM, if I'm looking at, let's say my plum tree has a, a problem and I don't really know what it is, um, I'm not sure what I'm looking at. I can go to the UCIPM website, I'll look up plum trees, all of the pest problems that a plum can get, be it a disease or an insect will come up and then through a little bit of research and process elimination, I can identify, oh, that curled leaf on my plum was actually aphids and not leaf curl. So I'm gonna get, you know, maybe insecticidal soap to take care of it as opposed to an organic fungicide. So very helpful. And then a couple of really uh, awesome gardening reference books that I love is a Sunset Western Garden book for uh, of edibles or how to grow more vegetables by John Jarvins. And then of course the um, Golden Gate Gardening book by Pam Pierce. These are all really wonderful resources for us that really help us grow healthy gardens uh, with a less toxic approach, but also with a water wise approach. And, you know, all of these books address, you know, beneficial insects and um, talk a little bit about, you know, soil health and, you know, managing weeds and other pest problems that are common, but also how to grow these vegetables for maximum harvest and health and um, yeah, bounty. So it's a lot of fun. So check them out. So with that, I'd like to thank you for joining and I'd love to finish with your questions, but I'd also like to share if we don't get to your questions tonight, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or if a question comes up, you know, in the future, uh, you can find me at Suzanne at plantharmony.org or go to my website and check it out for any other, you know, upcoming webinars I might be teaching. And you can also follow me and some of the other um, really great uh water agencies and, you know, county resources uh, on, you know, social media. So check us out. Hey, thank you so much, Suzanne. Before we get into the Q&A, I did want to share a couple resources specific to Milpitas and Sunnyville residents. Um, Albany, can you make it so I can share my screen? Yes, just a second. Okay, there you go. Great. All right. Um, so we did just want to um, mention that um, we do have rebates for Imilpitas and Sunnyvale. We work with Valley Water. So for these rebates, you can do a lawn conversion where you get $2 a square foot, um, $2 per square foot of lawn replaced for Melpitas and $1 for Sunnyville. We also work with Valley Water on irrigation equipment upgrades. This includes inline drip conversion that Suzanne was talking about and smart controller rebates. Um, and there's rainwater capture rebates as well. We also work with Valley Water um, for a gray water landscape rebate program. And then last but not least, um, 
One second. Well, it's okay. I just wanted to mention that we are having several upcoming Earth Month events. Um, and that you can check back at our webpage and I'll um, send that out as well, that we do have a climate reality demo coming up tomorrow and a kids eco hero event as well. So we can send links to that. I know um, Albany can send the link to the Sunnyvale um, Earth Month events as well. Of course, yeah, thank you for, um, sorry, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah, thanks for mentioning um, the upcoming Earth Week events, Linda. Um, at Sunnyvale, we have a zero waste cook along happening tomorrow. And then we have a composting workshop on Friday, which would go great with what Suzanne just taught us. Um, we also have an EV workshop happening this Saturday. So I will drop the link um, for our landing page for those events right now. And I'd just like to give the gray water laundry to landscape a shout out. Uh, it is very easy to install. Um, a three-way valve is really all you need. There's a couple of other things, but it's very, very simple. Uh, there's a couple of caveats, just the laundry needs to, or washer machine, our clothes washer needs to be um, against a wall or very close proximity to a wall that is on the other side of that wall is the garden. And that, that laundry needs to be above grade. So if we live downhill of the, the garden, it's not gonna work, but if we live at, you know, just slightly above the grade of the garden, it's excellent. And it's free water that we can be watering our fruit trees and so many of our ornamental uh, trees and shrubs and perennial food crops and um, perennial flowers. It's really great. We just have to change the type of soap we use when we are watering the garden and understand that three-way valve is set up so that it it can either go out to the garden or it goes to the um, into the sewer system. So it's not that we're always watering the garden and it's like, let's just say we have like grimy clothes one day, like maybe we, I don't know, uh, we're working with um, fiberglass. I don't know, I can't think of anything weird, but uh, just keep in mind that those are some really just, it's, it's the easiest, very simple thing to uh, um, employ and it's just a way to capture water. Uh, rain barrels are also really fantastic because just uh, one inch of rainfall over a thousand square foot roof, we can capture over 600 gallons of water. But since we're not gonna get rains for a while right now, maybe this weekend, but that's something to look at in the fall. But what we can do right now is set up a laundry to landscape. It's fantastic. Right, and that the gray water program really pays back, um, or it can, yeah. as you saw in that slide, you can get up to $200 in rebates for, for signing up for that. So, so you're cool. right, it is great. <laughs> All right. Great, well, let's get into the Q&A. So we have some good questions, Suzanne. Thank you all for, for being patient of saving the questions to the end. Um, we have a question about, we have a couple ones about compost and fertilizer ratios. So we have one that says, um, when you see a fertilizer that says like three numbers, four, six, two, what does that mean? And what ratio should they look for? So th that's the NPK, that's the uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And when we're working with organic fertilizers, they're typically really low, um, you know, maybe a 534 or 354, something like that. Um, typically, oh, understand. So the nitrogen is going to be like the first number, the N is the above ground growth, all the leafy growth, the middle. Uh, number is the um, phosphorus, which is helps with like root growth and flower production. And then the um, uh, potassium and PK, yeah, uh, is kind of all around. So typically, um, I don't get that hung up on the numbers so much. I usually am just buying a really good quality all-purpose fertilizer or I'll buy one that's specific for like vegetables. Um, and then 
or fruit trees. And then um, I am adding it according to the label, the packaging will say add a couple tablespoons or add like a quarter of a cup or something like that. When we're working with organic fertilizers, it's um, one of the good things is you can't overdo it. Okay. Uh, it's not going to burn your plants unlike the chemical fertilizers. And, um, yeah. And then, but, and if I'm working with the alfalfa meal, I'm doing equal parts. So if I'm doing like a quarter of a cup of my all purpose or my veggie food, I'm also going to do a quarter of a cup of the alfalfa meal and mix them together and plant it with, and then sprinkle in a couple of um, tablespoons or so of the earthworm castings. And that's in addition to some compost. And for compost, I might um, work in about, um, depending on the size of the containers. So like, let's say I have a one gallon container, I'm going to work in about that much same volume of compost into the soil. So I'm gonna dig my hole, work in some compost. So it's like, like equal parts and then put my fertilizer there. My organic fertilizer wants to be in the root zone. Then I plant my plant, I plant my plant slightly high so that I can put mulch on top of the soil without coming around and you know burying it. If we go like this, then soil and mulch can come down and sometimes uh, bury the plants. And then I start to water. I start to water deeply. And then as the plant grows, the root system grows, I bring the water out. I bring maybe more emitters around, make, I can continue to move it out because I want the root systems to continue to grow out. Okay, hopefully I answered your question. Great. Um, let's see, are the compost products from the store the same as the compost you make with fruit and vegetables? And then to add on to that, um, if you pick up compost from the Sunnyvale Smart Station or from Melpitas' compost giveaway, should that be mixed with soil or laid on top? Okay, good question. So compost is um, anything that we've taken like food waste or yard waste and it's a combination between, you know, like greens and browns and air and water, and it starts to break down and the bacteria and the fungi start to decompose it. And it goes from what was once recognizable food waste and yard waste to what looks like soil. And it's just beautiful and it smells really uh, yummy like the forest floor. And then that's compost. And we're going to work that into our soil, the garden soil. Um, what we buy at the store is that compost, it's organic matter. And depending if what the purpose is, like if we're buying potting soil for containers and pots, typically it's compost blended with like vermiculite and perlite. So that's something we would not work into our soil. But if it's planting mix or raised bed mix, it's going to be a combination of organic matter and typically, you know, like some fur bark or something like that, you'll see, you can read the, ingre re the ingredients on the bag. Sometimes there might be chicken manure. Sometimes you'll see also that there'll be some fertilizer like alfalfa meal, kelp meal, things like that. And then that's going to be, you know, something that you can just plant right into, or you can integrate it and work it into any soil from the previous season. Wait, and was there another part of that? Oh yeah. And then the stuff that you buy from like the city or you go pick up for free at the city, um, that's what we've put in the green waste bin. So if we have a green waste bin at home and we fill that up, that goes to the municipal uh, compost station and they compost it. And then they, you know, if they're passing it out for free, you can go pick it up. And then you'd wanna mix it in with your existing soil. Great. I did want to share that we have our compost pickup event coming up. So Yay. join us on April 24th from 7 to 11. Um, Milpitas Sanitation is giving away compost for all Milpitas residents. And Albany, I believe you guys have the smart station as well. Yes, we do. Um, residents can stop by the smart station um, at any time and pick up several gallons of free compost. All you have to do is bring your own container. Great. So a couple other questions here. 
What is earthworm casting? If you're using a garden box and do not have earthworms in your box, can you still use this? Oh yeah, the earthworm castings uh, come from the earthworms. Uh, we can buy it in bags. It's very easy to buy and it's actually starting to be a little bit more popular. Uh, I certainly see it at you know local box stores and lo local garden centers. Um, and that I, I am a huge fan. I put earthworm castings, uh, every, every plant I have, I put uh, like a tablespoon every once in a while on my house plants. I put it out in my potted citrus. I put it in my garden. So, um, a little bit goes a long way. It really packs a punch, but it is like one of the best things you can do for your, the health of the soil, the health of your plants. And it really makes those plants, uh, healthy and resilient. Great. Um, let's see what else we've got here. We have a question about planting timing and arugula. Can arugula still be planted in April or is it too late? Um, no, just, well, seeds or plants. If it's the plant itself, you could plant at any time. And to be honest, I just found a pack of arugula seeds uh, that I was going to broadcast out, but it would have to be an area where I know it's getting watered. So ideally you do it before the rainy season, but uh, it is certainly not too late. It is certainly not too, too late. It's kind of like a year round thing, if you ask me, but it just wants to have a little bit of around where there's some irrigation. Great. Another question about some specific plants in the Bay Area. We have a question on raspberries or blackberries um, and if those grow well in the Bay Area or what specific types you suggest for those. They, they absolutely grow well. Um, in fact, blueberries grow extremely well if we have a slight slope or if they're on the up uh, like if our garden just has a slight uphill area, uh, because then they're a little um, draft of wind will come under them. They really love that. But again, these are plants that are going to become, um, you know, more perennial where they're growing year after year. And in time, they're not going to require as much fertilizing or as much watering as those annual food crops like you know, um, lettuces, cucumbers, tomatoes, things like that. So I encourage you, all of you to get really curious and to look at how much food can I start to grow that's actually a year round crop. That is, I'm sorry, a year round plant. That's something that we're not constantly um, replanting and amending and all of that. It's just, we plant it one time. And then from there, we might just top dress with a little bit of uh, compost. We might fertilize once or twice a year, put some mulch on top of that soil, water deeply. We don't water again until that soil's dry a few good inches down. Way easier and less effort and less resources than annual food crops. Great. And delicious. All right, that's awesome. Yes, delicious crop, delicious water ice crop. That's what we want. Um, tomatoes got scarred on my plant. Is that because of too much water? Tomatoes were scarred? That's what they wrote. I'm not sure, but they, it could have been. I know that they'll crack if they have too much water. Um, and also I know if you're watering too much, you're actually losing the flavor. So really by August, I, um, when the, when the crops really start to come on the tomatoes, you know, cause sometimes we're not really getting tomatoes. We're not really harvesting until July seems kind of late, but, and then by August, you know, end of July, August, I've really reduced how many days of the week I'm watering. I'm typically have dropped it down to like one or two days and I'm in a hot part of the county um, because those plants are big and they're shadowing the soil. And so there's gonna be less water evaporation. I've also taken advantage of putting a nice mulch later on top. And by then I've 
pruned my tomatoes up about good 18 inches because the plants are already like as tall or if not taller than me. So I've pruned them up so there's more air circulation under there. They're still shaded. The water, I'm not, I'm feeling the soil. I want to make sure that soil is dried out before I water again. So yeah, that could have been the case. Great. Let's see what else we've got here. Also feel free to raise your hand if you want to talk to Suzanne directly. Um, what veggies grow well under shaded sun if I don't have a lot of sun in my yard? Um, you're going to be looking at like a lot of leafy greens, such as lettuces, spinach. Um, if it's a cooler area of the garden, you know, of course, um, you can look at uh, chard and kale. Um, we can look at, you know, other cold crops like uh, cabbage and broccoli. They take a little longer there and sometimes they're kind of space hogs, but um, cooler season. Uh, can definitely, like a lot of cooler season um, uh, food crops can take a lot of shade, but also you want to um, maybe just check in at the garden center. I know that there's like um, rhubarb likes to have some shade um, off the top of my head. That's all I can think of. Uh, herbs, you know, you know, parsley and cilantro can handle a little bit of shade if it's still, if it's warm, but shady. That can, um, you know, and again, what time of the day is the sunshine? Is the sun in the afternoon or is it the morning? Because also um, basil and peppers can handle some shade as long as they're still getting that heat. Great. On the shade question, is shade cloth the same as row cover? Oh, great question. It is not the same. So row cover will uh, offer shade. Um, but when we're buying shade cloth, we're specifically buying a, per, uh, a shade percentage so we can still allow, well, the uh, row cover lets UV through, but I'm not sure what the percentage is. And we have a tendency, it has a tendency to really lock in the heat, especially if we've, um, you know, covered all of the area. Shade cloth is something that we're intentionally using to create shade, but we're going to allow um, maybe a larger percentage of sun to come through. Great. What else have we got here? Um, oh, we have a couple of questions about mulch. So we have a question about what really works best for mulch, if leaves from the trees in the yard can be used, and then adding on to that, using wood chips, is it okay if they're big or you should really only use smaller pieces of wood chips? Yeah, those are all really wonderful questions. So when we are talking about mulch, mulch is anything that lays on top of the soil to protect it. I am a huge fan of anything that's going to be of organic matter, you know, because there could be things like um, oyster shells that are crushed or um, like newspaper or cardboard. Um, even there's like a rubber mulch, but what I really prefer is, um, you know, like I said, a wood chip, some type of a wood chip. And yes, leaves are nature's mulch. However, depending where we are, uh, I know that once the leaves are um, really, really dry, they have a tendency to be a little bit more of a fire risk. So it is, you know, if you're in a more fire prone area, I would uh, maybe rake the leaves up in some areas and maybe put them in the compost or put a layer of mulch on top of those leaves. And the mulch I'm talking about would be like a bark chip. And the size of the bark chip is really whatever aesthetically you choose. I'm a fan of an arbor mulch, you know, what the tree tr trimmers will put through their chipper and you can get it at local um, landscape supply stores for usually, it's usually the least expensive mulch that you buy when you're at the bulk yards, soil yards. Um, but you can also go and, you know, I know like when you buy bags of mulch, it's sometimes called micro bark or, you know, maybe there's a larger chip, like a little fur bark chip. So whatever size is nice for you, of course, if I have a lot of tender little vegetable starts, the bigger chips sometimes are too big for my vegetables. So I have a tendency to go for a finer mulch if I'm mulching around my veggies or any new plantings. But for perennials, 
fruit trees, anything that's more established, I'll go for a bigger, chunkier bark because it will break down uh, slower. You know, it'll last longer and it also provides habitat for beneficial insects. Great. Um, we have a specific question about a lemon plant. Um, this resident said a lemon plant and the planter box got leer curl. What should they do and why did that happen? Um, I would look number one to see is the water draining? Is there um, good drainage? Is that soil able to dry out? Um, then from there, I would ask how often are you fertilizing? I know that um, citrus, they're evergreen fruit trees and they're heavy feeders. That means they really like to be fed. So through the growing season, which for me is typically uh, March through about October, I will feed my citrus about once a month uh, with a dry fertilizer, you know, something from um, like, any, like EB Stone or Kellogg's or Down to Earth, any of those, you know, or Job's or Espoma. Um, we want to get a good quality organic uh, citrus fertilizer. And according to the, we're going to uh, apply it according to the labels uh, or the packages instructions, but typically you're going to be applying about once a month. I also will alternate with those liquid fertilizers that I showed earlier, like a fish emulsion with kelp is one of my favorites. And I will alternate, you know, like one week I'll do um, the dry fertilizer and then maybe two weeks later I'll do a liquid and then two weeks after that I'll do dry. And then I really make sure that those citrus are healthy and happy and getting well fed. Those are some things I would look at. Great. Um, I only see one more question in the chat. So on the question and answer box, please raise your hand if you want to be unmuted and talk to Suzanne or add more questions to the chat. I do see that we have 37 people still online, which is great. Um, this question that I have right here is a 10 inch pot too small for tomato and peppers. 10 inches, a little small, uh, unless it's a patio tomato. So uh, there are like smaller um, tomato plants these days. They're called patio tomatoes, or, you know, you can look at the heirloom varieties and see what's going to be a determinant, uh, like smaller size or like a dwarf uh, tomato plant. Peppers, same thing. And um, what's nice is that what these, um, if we could get a little bit larger, the larger the container we can handle, the better. And the reason why is because the root systems of these plants really like to grow, but also um, we really wanna make sure there's enough nutrients, enough soil medium for the root systems to expand as well as water to kind of move through it, which means uh, infiltrating down and evaporating out. We so have you can, a you can do it, but it'll be, it might be a little tricky. We have a follow-up on the mulch. Does that mean you yank out the mulch layer for next planting season? Uh, no, typically I will either rake it to the side if I have to plant, or if it's really fine and mostly broken down, I'll just turn it into the top couple inches of the soil. Oh, Suzanne, here's a great question for you. Squirrels are getting into everything. How can I discourage them? Um, should I use chicken wire or any other suggestions? Yeah, so uh, working with exclusion, uh, making exclusion baskets or exclusion um, cages, which could be you know anything that I might uh, make to like kind of fit over my plants. You could use, uh, I have a friend that had a bird feeder that had a squirrel baffle, but the whole thing broke and, but she kept the baffle and just put it now over one of her decorative pots. And it, so it looks really nice. It prevents the squirrels from coming in and digging in the soil. Poultry wire is a very inexpensive uh, material that's easy to bend and mold and you can, uh, you know, shape it over um, uh, like a, I have like a five gallon bucket that sometimes I'll shape to make gopher baskets, but I might do the same thing. Or I might make a frame that is out of uh, like one by one or two by two tree stakes, kind of like uh, screw them together and staple the poultry wire on. And now I've got baskets that I can lift up and put over my plants. I do that also in areas of the garden where I know the deer still can make their way in. I'll put um, 
or rodents, you know, it depends on what the critter is that I'm trying to prevent will dictate the size of the wire that I use. Like if it's half inch hardware cloth or quarter inch hardware cloth or poultry wire, things like that. Great, one follow up on the compost ratios. Um, so when you have your compost, um, it, when you mix it with soil, what percentage? And I think you did mention kind of laying it on top, but they wanted more specific, is it like two inches on top or kind of once you have your, your compost and how to, kind of incorporate it percentage wise and on top of the soil? Yeah, it kind of depends on this, your soil. Like if your soil is like in good shape and it feels like it is good and it smells good and it still has some life, then, you know, um, laying out about an inch and working that in is fine. But if it's like soil that is really like crummy and dry, and doesn't have a lot of life, then you might want to put, you know, two to three, even four inches and then like work it in. Um, and if that, you know, the crummier the soil, uh, the more effort, you know, it, it might take a couple of years before it starts to be really, you know, nice. But um, that's something that's a little hard for me to sh to just say it because it's very site specific. So sorry about that. Cool season veggies. When do you know to get rid of cool season veggies if they're still producing, but you want to make room for warm season veggies? <laughs> I know, right? Well, usually they start to bolt, but uh, you know, go to flower. But you can also just give yourself permission to rip them out, or that's if you've got the space. Usually, what happens is you you build another raised bed because you know that's what happens. Um, but yeah, you either have to just yank out the old and out with the old and with the new or you know get a get a half barrel to get the other one started and going until the other ones are gone or yeah it's a predicament I, I it's a predicament I'm faced with so I can empathize <laughs> going back on timing uh, what veggies are supposed to be rotated each season around the garden all veggies so we're always rotating our veggie crops not perennials so the ones that are just in the ground for the duration of their life those stay but our annual veggie crops like our cucumbers our carrots our tomatoes or summer squash we're always rotating them um let's see do you have to worry about the roots of plants in black containers getting too hot yeah we could so um, that's something to consider. If you're in a super hot area, you know, or if you know your patio or your backyard happens to like bake, then black pots might not be the better choice. Maybe terracotta would be a better choice or maybe having a, a pot that's a lighter color or, um, you know, maybe draping some, um, you know, that row cover that's white around the pots so that it's white and not black. Those are some tactics or shade the pots and not the plants. Great. Um, how can they use eggshells in the garden? Eggshells, I would maybe, um, you can crush them, put them around your plants because they work really well as a barrier from slugs and snails. Um, you can work them into the soil away from the root zones because as they decompose, they could add, you know, um, they could, it could, the bacteria could heat up the area. And if it's too hot, it could burn the root systems. Um, you can crush it, uh, you know, really fine and uh, plant them a little deeper, like a few inches or maybe. Um, uh, a good solid like six inches deeper than like the root zone of a tomato, things like that. Or you can also integrate them into your compost or your worm bin. Great. Um, what should you do if your plants aren't growing at all? This resident says they have chili and tomato plants and they're just really struggling and want to know what to look at. Right now, are they not growing now? Because if it's now, I don't, maybe it's not hot enough yet. So those are two plants that really require warmer temperatures and our evenings are still, you know, rather cool. The soil is still cool. We've had some heat, but it, it's gotten cool again. So I would say be patient and um, they, they will start to grow. It's still very, very early. 
Great. Um, we have a follow up question on when you discussed cutting the tomato plants at the base and leaving the roots in the ground. If you could just explain a little bit more why you do that. I don't rip any of my plants out. I always cut them at the base because I don't want to disturb the microbiology that's in the soil. And then I'm going to uh, plant fava beans or other plants opposite, um, you know, or in the, in the void places that those plants were. So that's why we go on that grid system again. And I just slightly move the grid. So if I've got four plants planted like this, then my next four are going to be planted just off center like that. Did that make sense? But yeah, I don't rip out my plants. Um, I'm not I'm not working the soil and tilling it and doing all of that. I kind of just let the, the root system stay in place. And then I plant around those root systems. And then they offer food for the next root, the next food crops. Great. Um, another compost ratio question. When you amend your raised bed, what percentage should you use soil to compost? Um, so you've got existing soil in your raised bed. You're going to say, do the same practice if it were just on the ground or in that raised bed. So uh, again, I'd be putting like you know, one, two, three, four inches of compost on top, depending on how crummy that soil is. And then we'll be mixing that in to the, um, mixing it into the top few inches. If it is, uh, you know, if the soil is just simply like lost volume has really dropped a number of inches, then I'd probably just get like a raised bed mix or a um, planting mix just to raise the volume. And I might just slightly mix it into the top couple inches. We're not mixing it in a lot. We're just kind of incorporating it so that it's not like um, one layer of light and fluffy with the existing soil. We want to just slightly integrate those two. Great. Um, I think those are most of the questions I'm seeing. Any, any other last one, please type them in. Um, Oh, here we go. <laughs> what is an ideal raised bed size? Whatever you can handle. Uh, that's a good question. I have learned from my uh, mistakes that if it's too wide, you can't harvest. Um, so uh, I usually, mine are usually three feet wide by what, six feet? No, four feet. I don't know. I've got an eight foot fence board that I work with. So or 10 foot, sometimes it's a 10 foot. I don't know, my husband makes them. But anyway, they're usually about three by three feet wide by five feet, maybe two and a half feet. No, it's three feet by five feet. That's what I do. But they can really be any size that you want. Um, you know, they can be really narrow and long. But what if they're too fat, then it's hard to like reach back and harvest. Um, and then of course they could be whatever size, I mean, tall. Uh, you want. So if you have like an achy back or if you can't kneel on the ground anymore, or you don't want to, you can have taller ones. So it's really, um, yeah, designer's choice. Great. I think your comment here kind of addressed one of the comments about having a achy back and what you can do. And they also wanted to know how much time you spend in the garden and if it hurts your back. Um, I've, yeah, I've worked in gardens, um, for just about my entire adult life as a professional gardener. So what really hurts actually nowadays are my knees. And that's normally uh, the one thing that if I'm on a big hike, I'm like, oh, my knees. Mm -hmm. So uh, sadly, that's the, um, that's, yeah. But other than that, get you got to do your yoga. Your yoga is really good for uh, helping us strengthen our lower back and all our muscles when we're working in the garden. So just counterbalance and give yourself a little time to do some yoga after and before working in the garden. Great. We have another compost question. To improve dry soil, should we mix compost or clay soil deep into the ground or just place it on top? You're going to want to integrate the compost into your clay soil. So you're gonna work it in. So um, that's going to be the best way to, uh, and then the microbiology will continue like those worms and all those other organisms will continue to integrate the, the soils 
um, in, in improving that structure. So you'll have to work it in. Great. Um going to give a couple more minutes if anyone have any other questions. I can also add that when we have that dry soil, the best thing you can do to it is put a layer of mulch on top. The mulch protects the soil and it prevents it from making that hard crust. So in some areas where it's really, really hot and we have clay soil, what happens is, is when that soil dries out, it's, it's like concrete. We can't even get a pickaxe into it. So what's really important is to make sure um, we're, we're able to get some organic matter in there. And if the soil is really, really bad, you might even want to consider sheet mulching and giving it a little time before you plant into it. And that's just layering cardboard, multiple layers of cardboard overlapped with no less than three inches of mulch on top. And then just let the microorganisms do the work. And then about a year to 18 months later, you're going to be able to dig in that soil with a lot of ease. It's going to be rich and alive and really great. But if that's, you know, not something you're able to do, at least get some mulch on top of the soil to help protect that soil. Great. I think that is all the questions that we are seeing. We want to thank everyone so much for spending your evening with us. Yeah, thank um, you, everyone. This class is going to be recorded. Be patient with Basta for posting it to the website. Um, and yes, thank you so much, Suzanne. Thank you, thank Albany. You. And thank you, everyone. Please uh, join both Sunnyvale and Milpitas for our upcoming Earth Day events tomorrow and the rest of the month. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Suzanne. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Happy Earth Day.